Well, Colleen, thank you, and thank you, Smoky Mountain Symposium, for inviting me to Pigeon Forge. My name is Sam at UC Davis Medical Center, where I've been for almost 41 years. You know, it's like a prison sentence. You know, <laughs> this feels like a parole. You know, I get to get out and see what the rest of the world does. But it really is a pleasure to address my kin, and I say that sincerely because many of your kin, when I was a fellow at UC Davis back in 1982. They saved me from killing my patients in the ICU. Stop, don't do that, you know, because people were like really short of breath to Kipnik, and I was jacking up the respiratory rate. Oh my God. And I've learned um, since 1996 when I started the severe asthma program at UC Davis that, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. Thank you for coughing on cue, whoever did that. That's great. <laughs> but I'm here really you know, to talk not only about type 2 inflammation, which I'll define, and about dupilumab or dupixin. Uh, I'm here to talk about how important it is for registered respiratory therapists to really embrace the future today. Because at UC Davis, when I started the program in 1996, everybody thought it was going to be a joke because I only had two respiratory therapists. I didn't have a nurse. I didn't have a pharmacist. I just ran with two wonderful expert respiratory therapist. I taught them what I teach my fellows. I mentor allergy and pulmonary critical care fellows. I'm a pulmonologist, so I'm an endangered species. Now, no, seriously, if you go online, you'll discover that 92.4% of us pulmonologists are over age 55. And a lot of that has to do with the pandemic. So if I had a glass, you know, I would raise my glass to all of you for championing your purpose, your career, in saving people's lives during the pandemic. Thank you. <clears throat> but I, what I found out was that when, when, you know, given a little bit of wiggle room, I was able to convince the administrators who don't know what the hell was going on, you know, that patient care comes first and patient safety never ever happens by accident. And it's startling to see how the most meaningful change in our workplace comes from people or friends you least expect. And I'm talking about all of you, registered respiratory therapists. Because, you know, we are all susceptible to suggestion. And what I'm gonna try and teach you all is the information that your patients need to know so that they can get to a better level of patient safety. In fact, we're gonna define insanity, and it's exactly as what Albert Einstein said, or he has been quoted to say. So we're going to talk about targeting systemic and localized type 2 inflammation in the steroid-dependent asthma attack. You probably know these people from wherever you've been here <clears throat> in Tennessee, Kentucky, Louisiana, or you know, Virginia, or North Carolina. You know who these people because they're, they're freaking flyers. They come in and out of the emergency or their hospital. Or worse, they have near federal asthma intubated in the ICU. We're going to talk about these patients who have basically failed therapy. And this is where insanity comes in. How many of you know of a patient who keeps, keeps being prescribed inhaled steroids combined in a fixed dose combination with a long beta agonist and the doctors or the nurse practitioner or the uh, physician associate or the pharmacist is waiting for the medicine to work? If it's going to work, it would have worked one to two weeks after starting if they know how to use the damn inhaler. That's, that's job security. And that's the first thing I do in this clinic. I don't put them on a biologic right away. Plus, I know from making mistakes, that's called experience, we make mistakes and learn from them, that about 33% of the time, patients who have asthma don't have asthma. So 33% of the time, they're misdiagnosed. But in addition to misdiagnosis, you know, oftentimes they're suffering from, you know, this drug side effects of steroids, and they don't need They're not going to benefit. They don't need it. But again, the definition of insanity in primary care is that they do the same thing over and over again, and they're expecting a different result, right? So next time you, you go back to the ER, to the hospital, or the ICU, look for evidence of insanity, okay? Now, this is not my slide, nor is that. Okay, Jason. Hey, technical difficulties. Thank you, Jason. Tell a joke. Okay, this is for my patients. I get all my jokes for my patients. This, 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 um, it's very sad because uh, 
you know, this, this patient who gave me the joke, his wife passed away, and he passed away just a few months after. There's something called the broken heart, and he, he had that. Whereas I still have a cell phone on my phone because I love him. But anyway, he said, you know, there was the church minister and this taxi driver. They died at the same moment. They ended up at the gates of heaven, and they were met there by, who is it? Uh, Saint, not St. Saint Nicholas, but St. Paul? St. Peter's, thank you. <clears throat> and so St. Peter's opened the gates of heaven, and the minister tried to walk in in front of the taxi driver. But then, you know, St. Peter stuck his arm out and blocked the church minister, allowing the taxi driver to go in. Well, I'll tell you, the church minister was pissed, you know. He's just a taxi driver. You know, and St. Peter says, I, I know that, sir. You know, I've been preaching to your, to your congregation for 35 years until a few seconds ago. How come you let in first? Well, well we, we let people into heaven based on their merit. Well, I've been basically, as I said, preaching from the gospel, from the Bible. And see, St. Peter took a big, big depth and told him, sir, when you preach, your congregation fell asleep. When, when the taxi driver drove his car, the passenger prayed in the back seat. <laughs> okay, here is Gilbert. You know, when it comes down to it, patients are our best mentors. They really are true professors. And I, have, I, can't, I can't take any credit for starting the UC Davis Aspen Network program in 1996. It wasn't a stroke of genius. It was more like an atonement for my sins because... I started seeing my own clinic patients in the freaking hospital. I was notorious, you know, and I was like proud that I could bust through a clinic, get back into the ICU, you know, before 4 o'clock or 4.30. And the nurses would, you know, kind of give me grief. Hey, you're kind of late today because it's 5 o'clock. But then I started seeing my patient not once, not twice, but after the third time my patient from clinic was in the hospital, a different patient, for asthma and for COPD, I said, something's wrong. And then I came up with the idea, proposed it, you know, and the administrators laughed. And I went to pharma to get it funded because nobody asked, you know, um, I, 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 nobody would help me. But I knew this was the right thing to do because, again, you know, we need to be more patient-centric. And patient-centricity wasn't a concept back in 1995. But because of that, at UC Davis, you know, uh, now we have NIH-funded uh, research uh, studies ongoing. And, of course, the university takes all the credit. But the credit should really go to our patients for doing all the heavy lifting. But they can't do it without people like you all. We did the same thing for COPD in 2011, way before CMS decided to penalize hospitals for readmissions. And now, you know, since then, we've received eight consecutive years of recognition from U.S. News and World Report, and the hospital minister still takes credit for that achievement. It should go to the patients. But what is unseen is the important role of the registered respiratory therapist. Our asthma and our COPD program and our bronchiectasis program are owned by registered respiratory therapists. And you can do the same where you are. You just have to get a stupid physician like me to back you up, to take a bullet. <laughs> it all comes down to patient safety. And here we have Gilbert. Now, Gilbert looked like he had a little too much chicken filet, okay? But there's a reason for it. Chicken filet is great, but he's stuck on prednisone. And if you have to leave to go intubate somebody, hell, I, I, I have, I'd rather have you all intubate me than an intern or a resident. And if it's July, hell no. I'll, I'll keep sucking on the oxygen. You know exactly, I mean, that, that can only pass with somebody who has experience and expertise like you all. Now, Dupixin is indicated as an adult maintenance therapy for patients who are living with uncontrolled, moderate to severe asthma. But the darn thing is patients don't know what the hell control, uncontrolled asthma looks like. You know, only mommy and daddy kind of know, maybe your boyfriend and girlfriend or your husband and wife. So the patient has no idea, which is why it's important to use the asthma control test, the semi-quantitative too, that we've used to great uh, advantage. Dupixin is okay. It's FDA approved, which is kind of getting the Olympic medal you know, for drug safety and efficacy by the FDA, for patients six years and older, for children, for adolescents, for adults who are nothing more than big kids. It's not indicated for the acute relief of bronchospasm. That's still basically an indication these days for, you know, for motor combined with a long-acting steroid or, 
you know, an anti-inflammatory inhaler therapy, which combines budesonide with albuterol. And albuterol has fallen, basically, down to third place as a preferred rescue agent, according to the GINA guidelines issued this year. It's also not indicated for status as asthmaticus. You know, people are hospitalized, you know, or people who are in the ICU, or people who are, you know, near, near, near ready to die. But again, that may change, too. But it's very clear. It's contraindicated in those patients who get injected with this monoclonal antibody, and they develop, like, a severe hypersensitive reaction. There's no box warning as far as anaphylaxis. So patients don't have to carry EpiPen around all the time. For more information, again, you can check out the prescribed information. But what I hope to do is share with you really the highlights. You know, and you may say, hey, well, this is a promotional program, Sam. But you can say I'm promoting patient safety because patients need to know what you know. Now, they can't know everything I know because a lot of stuff I know is useless, like organic chemistry, OK? <clears throat> I don't know where I can use it, actually, in my practice. But I'm going to try and teach a little bit of immunology. So when you say to your pulmonologist or the emergency room doctor or to an internist who's scratching his or her head as to why this patient is being repeatedly you know, admitted to the hospital for asthma. Again, I want to thank Regeneron and Sanofi for sponsoring this presentation. Again, the material that you'll see is contained in the prescribing information. But this really applies to all the biologics. There's six around, and there's three more coming. So there may be, at the end of you know, maybe 2026, there's going to be eight of them. So you better jump on board right now to learn immunology, because immunology is here today. You can't escape it. I know a lot of it's technology. I know you had a lecture from you know, Dr. Professor Hess. You know, and it's all about mechanical ventilation. But I want all of you to do what my RTs are doing at UC Davis, and that's really promoting patient education. They see them in the hospital. I thought it would basically lengthen the hospital stay. We cut our hospital stay by two days for our patients with COPD, but we also see asthmatics and bronchiectomy, and we channel them into our clinics run, owned by respiratory therapists. What you need to know is that there's a lot of jargon out there, which is so confusing. When I heard the term type 2 inflammation, I was at an advisory board meeting, and I was you know, surrounded by allergists. I was the only poem there. And when I heard type 2 inflammation, I immediately thought, is that related to diabetes? And I didn't want to basically ask anybody, because they're all allergists. <laughs> allergists to the left of me, allergists to the right of me, allergists behind and in front of me. I said, hell no, you know. <laughs> you know what Mark Twain said, you know, it's better to keep your mouth shut, Sam, and, and look stupid than open it and remove all doubt. So I did some reading, OK? And type 2 inflammation actually refers to something that has been given to us by God and nature to protect us. But in the case of asthma, it's out of control. It's like if the air conditioning is too cold or if the heater is too hot. Type 2 inflammation is one of three branches of our cell-mediated immunity. And this is important to all you RTs, because this is what your patients are fighting with at home, in the clinic, and in the hospital. Type 2 immunity is what we use to kill off parasites if we happen to be, you know, inf infested with parasites. God help you if you walk barefoot in Kentucky, right? Stronger Lord is in the soil, all right? But type 1 cell media immunity is what you and I use to kill viruses and intracellular pathogens like tuberculosis. Everybody still with me? So type 2 cell media immunity that gives rise to type 2 inflammation, that basically is what we use to kill worms. And it's driven by IgE. It's driven using the, the biggest, baddest white blood cell in the body. And it's called the eosinophil. Type 3 cell media immunity is what we use to kill off extracellular pathogens. So this is where your, your staph, your pneumococcus, your pseudomonas, if you can get past the biofilm, comes into play. So in asthma, in COPD, and bronchiectomy, and many other diseases, Type 2 inflammation is a unifying concept that explains everything. And so what I want you all to do is what I tell the doctors to do, and, and, and it's the following. Let go of pathophysiology for a moment. Now, when you see somebody who's sick with asthma, what do you do? You throw them in albuterol, you give them an oxygen if they need it, and you put them on steroids. Well, that, what's that, what's that do? Well, it, tr it treats the oxygen problems they may have from mucus mismatching and mucus plugging. It, it, may, it may treat the, you know, kill off the eosinophils with you know, more prednisone and, uh, you know, what is it, uh, albedo, well, it dilates. But think about it. When patients basically, unlike the old days, when they come today to the emergency room, they've been taking albedo. They've been taking prednisone for three to four days before they come in. They don't want to come in. The food stinks at the hospital. 
And you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna get COVID if you go to the hospital. Everybody's gonna get sick this winter. Winter's coming, okay? Get your vaccines. So again, it's, it's very important to understand the terminology. So these people who have asthma, up to 84% will have type two inflammation, which means if you look at the cells, the receptors, and the cytokines that are involved, that's how you're going to reimagine your approach. In other words, I'm asking you to kind of let go a little bit of pathophysiology and begin to embrace not the biology, but the pathobiology, what the biology that leads to disease. Everybody with me? In other words, I want you to you know, look really intelligent, not stupid like me when you talk to your doctor. You know, this patient probably has you know, a particular phenotype I learned about. This patient's probably type two high. And a doctor would say, what the fuck did you just say? <laughs> And then you can educate, well, you know, it's one, it's one of three branches of cell mediated immunity. You know, probably interleukin, you know, four, five, and 13 are involved. And the doctors say, really? And, and there's clear evidence that this patient's failed standard of care. You know, patients have been treated with prednisone again and again. That's the definition of insanity. And the doctors say, well, what do you recommend? And that's your opening, okay? And that's what I mean, you know, when you, when you basically work with people who see everything from the beginning, I mean, I think you and pulmonologists need to be the premier asthmatologists in the country. I came up with that term in 2007, got it published. I got tired of explaining to people during Thanksgiving, what the hell I do for a living? I hate those people. They come up to you with a glass of wine, oh, what do you do? And I want to say, I want you to go to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> what does it matter? It's Thanksgiving. Let's, let's be grateful that we live in the greatest country. Let's be be grateful that we're alive. Let's be grateful there's no war on our home. Let's be grateful that there's no massacre in our town. It's nuts. This country is in a spiral, you know? So don't ask me about what I do for a living, you know? But, but getting back to what we do every day, what wakes up in the morning, what wakes us up in the morning with purpose, you're an asthmatologist and know that there are patients out there who have no idea what the hell is going on. All they do is to take their inhaler, and up to 80% of the time, they're not using it correctly. So how do you find these people? Well, you can probably you know, make a short list. I bet you can list three people already, but up to 84% will have type 2 inflammation, which means you're going to find biomarkers, little red flags. Their exhaled nitric oxide is going to be above 20 parts per billion. We can do that in the clinic. The eosinophil count would be at least 150, which is in a normal range if somebody doesn't have asthma, but in somebody who has asthma, especially uncontrolled, that's a red flag. Remember, the normal eosinophil count is between 15 and 500, and doesn't flag red on the EMR. So most of the doctors, oh, they, they're colorblind. They can't see it unless it turns red. Am I, am I telling the truth? It's like blood gases, you know? The CO2 is like uh, 100, and they think that's the oxygen, you know? Especially in July. How many, how many of you got sick in July and went to the hospital, the university hospital? It's dangerous. You got these younger, you know, younger people, and you say, oh, my God. You're going to tell me what to do? Can I see anybody older? Well, they're sleeping at home, you know? Very scary. But a lot of times, you know, before we had uh, introduction of biomarkers, just the clinical history. Listen to the patient. Hey, nothing's worked, Sam. You know, every, every fall and winter, my nose just does this. I mean, that's evidence of an allergic phenotype. In fact, there are five phenotypes identified by the World Health Organization in the Gene Guidelines. You know them well. <clears throat> allergic, non-allergic, asthma related to obesity, asthma with fixed airway obstruction. I have all four. I have allergic, non-allergic, I'm fat, and I have fixed airway obstruction. I grew up in South Central, I moved to Sacramento. We have the seventh worst air pollution in the country. Anybody want to move to Sacramento, earn less money? Just want to show you a way. What I do not have, ladies and gentlemen, is late onset. Typically happens in women after a severe viral infections, but you all, because you're asthmatologists now, you need to remember some people out there are very sensitive to NSAIDs. What are NSAIDs? Non steroid anti inflammatory drugs. Aspirin is, is in a way a part of it, but Motrin, Aleve, uh, you know, uh, Advil, and they keep popping it because they have headaches. It's the stress of life, you know, but be wary if that causes you know, asthma, they can end up in the ICU intubated by you. You know, so type 2 inflammation, evidence of uncontrolled type 2 inflammation, we, we can't assay the three cytokines that circulate in enormous amounts in spite of having prednisone or hydrosteroids in the body. And these three cytokines are like your high school locker combination. It's IL-4, 5, and 13. 
Remember how exciting it was to have a locker in school? You could decorate it, you know, and hide your stuff. And your boyfriend's picture, your girlfriend's picture. And mom doesn't know about that. But it can lead to mucus production, mucus hypersecretion. It can lead to increased airway, smooth muscle hyperreactivity. It can cause airway fibrosis, which I was taught back in 1975 doesn't exist in asthma. But it's true, and I'm living proof of that. A lie told often enough becomes the truth. This is why it's so important to have conferences, this symposium like you're hearing, having here with Smoky Mountain to really learn what your colleagues are learning. And I'm trying to tell you all, you belong where you are to teach everybody else. And if somebody doesn't want to listen to you, it's their loss, but you have to keep finding. Don't give up because you have an opportunity to, to really embrace asthma and COPD as we move forward, as immunology and therapies that address the immunological aspects of disease to help patients live a better and safer life. Again, you can also document this basically by looking for people who drop their lung function. It's like falling down a staircase. And these people typically, you know, if they have severe asthma as a child, guess what? When they become adults, they still have severe asthma. So you really, for all of you who take care of children and adolescents, that's where you really have to pull out all the stops. But that's not basically the strategy that's been promoted even by the NIH here in this country. So uncontrolled symptoms and exacerbations, those are key. But exacerbations cause people to lose lung function. It's the same uh, thing in COPD. Dupix is indicated for patients six years and older with moderate to severe asthma. Other biologicals are indicated just for severe asthma. And that's very you know, subjective. But again, you're looking at you know, a, a, an add-on biologic you know, to standard of care, which is ICS plus LABA. So somebody could be on, you know, medium to high dose inhaled storage plus a LABA. If they continue to have an asthma control test score less than 20, they need an asthmatologist like you to suggest, maybe we need to, step, to go to step five. And the, and the doctor will say, what are you talking about? Because when you say step five, immediately you're, they know that you're talking about a guideline. Nobody reads the guidelines because everybody remembers their last success or their last failure. But it's very important to you know, have evidence for you know, an eosinophilic phenotype. All you have to do is look at the CBC. Look at the white blood count, multiply it by the percentage of eosinophils, and if that number is 150 or greater, uh, and they're not on prednisone, you got a case that's worthy of reevaluation. You know, is it asthma? You know, can you basically phenotype the patient? And then very importantly, what is the mechanism of action? And the code word for that in circles, and I want you to join my conversation, is endotype. That's T, T, TH2 high or TH2 low, and to, to abbreviate is T2 high or T2 low. Well, T2 or non-T2, but like T2 high or T2 low. So, you know, in the ER or in the hospital, maybe this patient has T2 high asthma. And, you know, the doctor will look at, what are you talking about? You know, because it's not familiar. And again, it's about sharing information with each other because, you know, teamwork makes the dream work, which is why, you know, I really make a big deal of that in a book chapter I just wrote and published in Principles of Critical Care. I'm talking about status asthmaticus in ICU. The team approach is key, and the RT is really central to a successful management of a patient. The patient is in the center of our universe, but you need teamwork. You got to include the nurse, yes, you got to include the pharmacist, absolutely. Okay? But it's, it's teamwork, and you need leadership. So, eosinophilic disease is not the only aspect of asthma, there's other components, and it's, it's, it's the allergic driven component. And this is where mast cells come in. So, I said earlier, you know, what cytokines are involved? I just ta I told you. It's, it's 4, 5, and 13. There are others that I would tell you if you want to know. But what cells are involved? You know, it's epithelial cells. You know, it's the skin of the airways. It's the lymphocytes. That's the T2 cell, T2 helper lymphocyte. It's the mast cells, the eosinophils. All these cells conspire, you know, under normal circumstances to protect us. But in asthma, something is dysregulated. And, and we have to basically modulate it. And you can't kill the patient. That'll stop the asthma if you kill the patient, right? Can't do that. No, Dupixin is the only biologic that can basically interrupt two pathways. All the other biologics out there that you can recommend to your prescribing colleague only interrupts one. And it does so basically by binding to a receptor subunit that's necessary to form the entire receptor. And so you block IL-4 activity and IL-13. IL-13, as I told you, is very important for mucus production, airway fibrosis, and smooth muscle hyperactivity, which is why you have to give albuterol a lot. But a lot of people, as I said, before they come to the ER, they've been dosing themselves with prednisone and albuterol, and what do we do in the hospital? We'll give them more. 
That's the definition of insanity again. You know, it's like, but nobody believes me because they think I'm stupid. I don't think I am, though. Let me ask my patients. But systemically, you can see this by an elevation IgE and eosinophils, and basophils are probably unsung perpetrators of damage. But mast cells, we know where they live. In other diseases, you know, they don't really live in any tissue, but in asthma, they live in the smooth muscle, which is a perfect location if you want to create hell on Earth. All you have to do is get these mast cells to degranulate. They release histamine, leukotrienes, you know, all these, oh, it's horrible. And then you get the late phase of asthma where the eosinophils come in and say, where's, where's the, where are the worms? Where are the worms? And once the, wor well, once the eosinophils get into the airway, they can't go back. You know, epithelium basically usually taut like my fingers. When, when you're exposed to the IL-13, this is what happens. This is normally what should. Then you got a free highway for the eosinophils going into the airway. They can't go back, of course, into the capillaries. Once they're in the airway, they're stuck. They die there. And when they die, they release what they call these extracellular traps. Those of you who take care of patients with cystic fibrosis, neutrophils release extracellular traps. It's, it's part of the DNA uh, 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 makeup. It's very sticky. And that's why sputum becomes very, very difficult to expectorate. Plus, the eosinophils will oxidize these hydrogels. That's a code word for mucus or phlegm. And it will cause you know, the mucus to become hard. And this is what basically causes all the symptoms. But that's what we've been doing all these decades. We've been treating the symptoms, but we're not treating the underlying cause. And the underlying cause, I'm trying to persuade you to believe, is type 2 inflammation that has been unchecked. So IL-4 and 13 contribute to localized inflammation as well as systemic inflammation. I hit this. And you can measure, basically, the activity of IL-13 if you do inter- uh, uh, Exonatric acid measurement, which, which a hospital administrator will tell you doesn't make any money. But that's not the point, is it? Is it money or patient safety? I always lose with that argument with administrators. They say, you know, they always tell me, you should be glad I can pay your salary. <laughs> You're not paying me anything, you know, for what I do day and night. Ugh. So let's get back to Gilbert. Gilbert's stuck on steroids, and he has been stuck on steroids for a while. In fact, the Chess Foundation, many of you belong to the Chess Foundation the American College of Chest Physicians. And ARC will also talk about this. When somebody needs prednisone, call what it is. You have a failure of your treatment plan. Go back to the beginning. Do I have the right diagnosis? Phenotype the patient, endotype them, and then figure out what you need to do to do another clinical trial of one. Because all the clinical trials, remember, they are artificially biased. You have inclusion, exclusion criteria. Don't reflect real world experiences, what you all are bringing here to patient force. It's your real world experience. So in this clinical trial for 24 weeks, they tried to get these people with asthma off of prednisone. They're stuck on prednisone. Average dose was like 11 milligrams. And they took these people in an open-label extension study after the first 24 weeks to see what they could basically see. Because this is very important if you're going to prescribe something. Because the patient will ask you, well, what happens after one year? You know? In fact, a lot of my medical students are really stupid. They'll say, well, this is great, Dr. Louis, but after 24 weeks, what do you do? Ha, ha, ha. You know, well, I said, you practice medicine. And then how did you get into medical school? You know? And that's what we do. You all practice medicine. And for anybody to tell you less, <laughs> just talk to the person you know, who you intubated that the doctor couldn't, OK? I rest my case. This all comes down to experience, really, which is nothing more than learning from your mistakes. And sadly, as I try to tell you all, sometimes I have to make the same mistake two or three times before I say, oh my god. I need to look at myself in the mirror. Again, if you look at the you know, demographics and the characteristics of these patients who were stuck on steroids, you see many of them are on the drugs that you and I see again and again and again. But something's wrong because they keep coming back for more, or they're stuck on prednisone every single day, like Gilbert. So here's, not Gilbert, here's Gabriel. I guess I said Gilbert all the time. Sorry, Gabriel. <laughs> I mean, if you leave Gabriel on steroids for a long time, he may get better with another burst of prednisone, but down the road, 5, 10, 15 years later, when I'll be underground, you know, six, six feet, he's going to have diabetes. Um, he may commit suicide because you know what steroids do. Go from top to bottom, cataracts, anxiety, depression, uh, pneumonia, heart attacks, go back to the head, strokes, uh, kidney failure, peptic ulcer disease, reflux, uh, Obstructive sleep apnea, you have a combined sleep uh, conference here too, which is great, you know, here in Pigeon Forge. Uh, what else? Osteoporosis and bone fractures. 
But, but people continue to use prednisone. Why? Because it's dirt cheap. That's the truth. But if you happen to put Gabriel on a course of Dupixin, you add it on to what he's already taking, and held third plus a long antibiotic to agonist, this is what you couldn't expect. An almost 90% reduction in the need for steroids or total elimination. A 60%, almost 60% reduction in exacerbation. And this is where it really is remarkable. If you look at the study, uh, the, the, the Quest study that evaluated exacerbations in patients that were given uh, a dupixin added on to their standard of care, there was an improvement in lung function that started to occur in two weeks. I mean, it was like all the way up like this quickly. And, and I've been asking the scientists at Regenera and Sanofi, how is this possible? And you're going to love this explanation. I said, well, it's probably all mucus plugging. And you know, I think I'm right. And if you love mucus like I do, you know, you want, you want it there to protect us, but we want too much, right? It's like the three little bears, you know. You've got to make sure that you have just enough. But when we have too much, all hell will break loose. And I think this is why the lung function improves, because it, it can't be that Dupixin dissolves all the fibrosis, all the collagen. It can't be that uh, this drug is a bronchodilator. It's not. But what do you see this improvement? You know, with albuterol, four plus, you're lucky to get something between 100 and 200. But with Dupixin, you get 220 in this study. In the other study, you can, if you do a sub-group uh, 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 analysis, you can get up to like 500 ml improvement from baseline. And this happens very quickly, within two weeks, if not earlier. And in the open label extension study, almost 80% of patients got rid of their need for prednisone, which means somebody like Gabriel can begin to exercise. You know, he won't be hungry. He won't be doing a lot of this action. You know what I'm doing? Open the refrigerator. It's, it's, it's really terrible. I mean, prednisone is poison. And people prescribe it. There's no box warning on it either from the FDA. You know, these are the, you know, eight-fold. Eight you know, that's not 8%. It's eight-fold. So if it's 15%, eight times 15, I can't do the math. You could do the math. This is what I'm talking about. Eight-fold increase in in osteoporosis and bone fractures, four-fold increase in pneumonia, uh, almost four-fold increase in stroke and heart attacks, uh, cataracts. But then don't mention the thing that's probably what does people in most of the time is anxiety and depression, even suicide. So I put a patient on a Dupixin uh, not that long ago. Her name is Linda. And it's my habit to call the patient basically about a week later. And I call up Linda and say, hey, hey, Linda, this is Sam. You know, Sam Louie, Dr. Louie. Hey, I want to ask you, how's your asthma? Sam, I can smell again. Well, well, that's great. No, you don't understand. I haven't been able to smell in 12 years. Well, that's great. What, what can you smell? My coffee. Oh, I, I love my coffee. Oh, well, well, that's great. No, you don't understand, Sam. You know, I can smell coffee, but there's some aromas I welcome back. There's some odors I never, ever, ever have to want to smell again. And, I, and I, I was already down the river without a paddle. I said, what do you mean? You know, <laughs> and she just kept on going. She said, Sam, you know, I was having coffee with my husband in the kitchen, and something didn't smell right, you know, something very foul. So I went to the trash can, and it was, you know, not the trash can. I went to the sink, to the garbage collector, and, and, and you know, grinder. It wasn't that. Open the refrigerator, and there was nothing in the refrigerator. When I closed it and walked toward my husband, the odor got stronger and stronger and stronger. <laughs> and, I, and I said on the phone, I, 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 was, was your husband? Yeah. But, but, but how's your asthma? Oh, it's been great. I haven't had to use albuterol for almost a whole week. And this lady was using albuterol four to six times a day. She didn't have nasal polyposis, which is one of the other indications for Dupixin. In fact, Dupixin is indicated for like six different things. Different things, but it's all united, all tied by type 2 inflammation. It has no relationship to diabetes. You're talking about a branch of your cell-mediated immunity that you're trying to immunomodulate. You're trying to get it down, just like with an ventilator. You're trying to adjust the IE ratio, adjust the respiratory rate, just to get the patient comfortable so you can see the patient breathing. Not like this, but like this. This is what you all taught me at the freaking bedside. So I thank you again. Look at the patient. Listen to the patient. They can't talk, but you can basically hear. So at UC Davis in Sacramento, it's like a salad bowl or rice bowl. Everybody has severe asthma because of the environmental pressure. We have so much agriculture. So all our patients are on 300 every two weeks after loading those 600. But in some parts of the United States, maybe here in Tennessee or Kentucky or adjoining states, you may want to use the 200, but we use the 300 almost exclusively. For children, the dose can be 100 or 200. So again, always, always 
read the prescribed information because safety never ever happens by accident. If you look at the most common uh, side effect is injection site discomfort or pain. Then 2% basically get a pharyngitis that goes away. And 2% after 16, 20 weeks can experience a, a eosinophilia field that doesn't lead to more disease. And same thing with, uh, you know, if you look at placebo, you know, people will get pain with the needle, you know, they'll get uh, sore throat, and, but less than 1% will get eosinophilia. So for those people, you, you need to really, you know, keep a track. And if you think the eosinophilia count to begin with is high, especially when it's over 1,500. Again, a normal eosinophilia count is between 15 and 500. And somebody who has asthma, if they have a 350, they need you. But the primary care physician and the ER doc would not know that because they're looking for something that's painted red. They're colorblind. Okay? But you now know. And you, can, you look at the track record. And the insurance company, you know, you just say, oh, you just give me a blood, the CBC with diff in the last six months. Now they want one in the last 30 days. Why? Because they want to contain costs. They're not interested in your patient's safety. Again, uh, there has been report of uh, so-called overdose. It's not what you think. It means the patient inject themselves before the two-week interval. Again, these patients have to load themselves and then have to inject themselves every two weeks with this monoclonal antibody. Again, this information is contained in your PI. So this is just a nomogram showing you basically how you dose it, basically. You have somebody 12 years and older. If you have a youngster, it could be to 100 or 200, but again, you really have to look at your patient. You can't just follow an algorithm, which I wrote in an editorial that was, that was refused to be published in any you know, good journal, so I published it in uh, Consultant. Created a column 10 years ago called Pulmonary Pitfalls, because I learned best by making mistakes. And this article is, is entitled Lies, Damn Lies, and Asthma. Okay? And, and, and there I bash these algorithms. And I know you all are, love algorithms because that's how machines work. You follow an algorithm. But in an in, in, in arena of drug therapy, you have to understand these algorithms are, are based on population studies. And, and, and at, the end of, at the end of the population study, when you use assisted, you distill somebody into you know, Mr. Average, Mrs. Average, and Mr. Average. And I've not met this person in 41 years. You know, to bring it down really grossly, it's like you take everybody in the state of California, you put it in a meat grinder, and what comes out as a meatball, that's who you're treating. OK? You're not treating you know, an individual. You're treating a meatball. And, and then what I learned the hard way also is that all patients are created equally different. So you have to start all over again from the beginning with every patient. You can't rely on your past success or your failure. You have to start all over again. You have to think. And if you surrender to algorithms, you're dead. You're brain dead. You have to think. Because you know, just like Terminators, algorithms have no remorse. I'm talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger, OK? Uh, if somebody is prescribed Dupixin and they get worse, then think of a systemic medium and small vessel vasculitis, or Churg-Strauss. Now they won't want to use that. They want to call it EGPA, which is eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Those are patients that need to be on prednisone daily and a different biologic. Again, if somebody gets worse on Dupixin, and on paper, they should get better. But remember what I'm going to tell you now. I told my patients in the clinic, I'm no more than a shoe salesman. I have to find the right pair of shoes for the patient. It takes time. I have to basically look at all the six that are available and ask the patient what they want. But at the end of the day, I still have to basically kind of you know, coach the patient in the direction that I think will help. And the patient doesn't get better in three to four months, I go back to the room, back room behind me and get another pair of shoes and try it. This is what you can do in a hospital. Start recommending biologics. Are you increasing the cost of care? No, you're decreasing the cost of care. The typical hospital admission at UC Davis now is $46,000 for an asthma exacerbation. The pharmacist will tell the patient, oh, these drugs are very expensive. It may cost you three dollars to $4,000 a month. That's baloney. I want to say, I want to use another word, but I can't. Patients either pay nothing, or at most, they pay about $200 a month. What price do you put on your patient's safety? Or well, let's make it a little more personal. Your family's safety, your children's safety. This is what's wrong with this country because everything is about cost effectiveness. It's not about patient effectiveness. Oh my God, I have to pay you all for coughing like that. That's great. <laughs> Be wary. These patients, when they get better on Dupixent, about 50 20% stop everything, okay? And then the insurance company will send you a letter. We will not uh, uh, prov provide prior authorization for this patient for the next three months. 
I had to write to the California Department of, of Insurance you know, and fight for these patients. And I tell the patients, you go to the pharmacy and you take it and you refill it and you use the held steroid, okay? Otherwise, I have to write another letter. I don't have time, but I did it. I had to make time. But bear in mind that these patients, when they do get better, it's going to be remarkable. And you're going to remember these people by their names and their stories, like I told you about, you know, Linda. She probably had nasal polyps, but when I look up the nose, I don't see anything. I mean, what do polyps look like in the nose? They look like peeled grapes. You know, you take a, a grape and you peel it. What you see is something kind of whitish gray and translucent. That's a polyp. Oh, you can eat uh, sashimi, but if you happen to basically get worms, that's an indication for ivermectin, okay? If the worms are still there, you stop the dupixin, you treat with ivermectin again, and you're good to go. You know, just check the poop. Um, <laughs> make sure there are no eggs and worms crawling, especially if you come from Kentucky. Do you have strongyloides here in Tennessee? You have strongyloides in Tennessee? A worm that drools down the, through the skin sole on your foot? Yeah, I, th I thought so. I mean, it's endemic in, you know, yeah, very good. If you have a child, basically, who uh, you want to start on Dupix, remember, it's down to age six years old. Make sure you've got all the live vaccines in before you consider starting. It's just, there's no, no data, but this is just a concern from the FDA as well as from Regeneral and, and Sanofi. Safety never happens by accident. There's not a lot of data on uh, 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 safety with uh, pregnancy, but I'm told that in the next two years, there's going to be a lot of data, basically, on pregnancy. But bear in mind that asthma is probably the most dangerous a lung disorder in people who are pregnant, you know, and if, if the mom is, has uncontrolled asthma, the baby's going to have issues when he or she comes out, you know, I'm talking about brain development, lung development, everything. And again, you, you know this place because you're called. I mean, I cannot get over how many times I hear you know, RT, stat, radiology. That's the worst place to run a code, you know. <laughs> and, then, and then it's July, and then you get a first-year fellow who, you know, don't know how to position the airway, you know, and you're, should I take over, Sam? Yeah, please do, you know. In other words, don't get sick in July. I think that's how they set it up, you know, when, when the interns come in, you know. <laughs> Everybody takes a vacation. <laughs> so, uh, to pick sent, every year they get a new indication, you know. There's hope maybe for one for COPD, but right now it has for atopic dermatitis, that's where it got its fame. That's eczema. Bear in mind, if a child has eczema, they're at higher risk for developing asthma as an adult, or even as an adolescent. It's indicated for moderate, severe, persistent asthma. It's the only biologic that's indicated for two different phenotypes. Eosinophilic, okay, defined as a blood eosinophilic, 150 or greater. If the patient's on prednisone, it may, it may be lower. This is where you have to do peer-to-peer -peer review. But also for patients like Gabriel who's stuck on steroids can't get off. I mean, if you involve the patient, if you give the patient this information, you still have to qualify. You know, what, is this, what do they say on Wall Street? Uh, past performance is no guarantee of future results. You're doing a clinical trial of one. But patients are not given a chance to do it. Any allergists here in, in the audience? They need to hear what I'm going to say. Allergists continue to give immunotherapy instead of biologics. These biologics, basically, you know, you have to deal with anaphylaxis. Allergists are really experts in anaphylaxis because they cause it every day in clinic. <laughs> There's a polyposis. Eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, a skin disorder, nodular, very itchy, that I've never seen before. I only found things on Wikipedia. Perigo nodularis. But there's going to be another one, maybe for urticaria, maybe hopefully another one for patients, especially our veterans who have COPD or you, know, you, you have somebody with asthma, you know, at the VA. For God's sakes, you know, Look at what they've been getting. Are they failing their standard of care? Is the, has the definition of insanity been met clinically? If it has, take credit for that. Start what we have at UC Davis. Anybody here know who Crystal Craddock is? She's like the cover girl for uh, respiratory care. Okay, never mind. You'll meet her sooner or later. She's the present and the future. I'm the present and the past. Okay? I'm trying to stay relevant in the present. But with dupixent, it's the only biologic that basically interrupts two pathways, not one. Basically, it helps you basically type, you know, target type 2 inflammation in that manner. You can treat more than one phenotype. You know, the eosinophilic phenotype, including the one that is steroid dependent. It's the only biologic that has been FDA approved. 
as I said, it's like winning an Olympic gold medal because they really basically had to give all their data to the FDA, and the FDA will vote on it, and they got it. But it comes down, to, I think, to education. And what we did basically with our COPD program, you know, the hospital said, if you're going to start this program, you're going to lengthen hospital into stay, which at that time was seven and a half days for COPD. Well, actually, we dropped it by more than two days. So our patients were discharged you know, two days before the ongoing average. And, oh, that brought smiles to, uh, you know, the hospital ministry. They can admit more people with trauma, with cancer, with elective surgery and all that. But I was happy just because my patients were safe. And, you know, when, when I can sleep at night, it's, a, it's been a good day. If I can't sleep at night, it's because I'm worried about a patient that I, I had to leave, you know, at the bedside. And I, you probably have the same thing. But m many of you do shift work. But, you know, when you come on, it's, you know, it starts all over again. And you, you, you basically put all your, your energy and most importantly, your empathy into it. Remember, empathy is never, ever an occupational hazard, which is why I want all of you, you know, to think about biologics, step five, to think about defining what controlled asthma is if, and what it isn't. When it, when it isn't, it's uncontrolled. And think about a failure you know, of existing therapy, standard of care in health start. Worry about the dangers of too much prednisone. Do not make the mistake I used to make. The reason why I ended up in the hospital before a clinic end for everybody else, because I used to prescribe and forget. Nah. Boy, did I learn my lesson the hard way, which is why I started the program. And again, still no funding from the hospital, you know. But we, we're the longest running chronic disease management program. But I like to tell you, we're not a disease management program, we're a patient management program. We teach the patient how to drive with their asthma instead of the other way around. I don't want the asthma to drive the patient. So with that, I'd like to open everything for questions. Any questions? Your asthmatologist, officially. Oh, my god. Everybody's coughing. <laughs> Colleen? You have a question back over here. Question? Yes, sir. The, the, the eczema is the independent indication for Dupixin. Typically, people get dupixent when they fail topical steroids, sir. And in, you know, if you have any, no, is it independent? Can you repeat the question because they didn't yeah. hear it up The here. question is, uh, eczema and asthma, are they related? The only way they're related is through type 2 inflammation. But eczema does not lead to asthma. Again, this is why I'm trying to say there's a foundational concept that I'm trying to convey to you, I want you to own after this uh, program. You know, type 2 inflammation, you know, IL-4, 5, and 13 are in play. And it just, it just so happens that if you, you know, disable some aspects of that inflammation, you can control these skin disorder or, you know, the lung disorder. Did I make sense, sir, with my answer? Just like, uh, you know, uh, nasal polyposis, it's not really a disease of the lung, but I can tell you, if your patient has chronic on your side of sinus with nasal polyposis, and they also have asthma, you won't succeed in controlling the asthma until you control this first. I learned that the hard way, too, taking care of patients who teach me. And like this perugal nodulars, I've never seen a case where you can go to Wikipedia and find some skin lesion, they're nodular, very hard and, and very itchy. They don't all develop asthma. So these are independent indications. And I made the mistake, sir, some time ago in the beginning when... Um, Dupixin was FDA approved in 2018. I kept asking all my patients that they had eczema. They don't have to have eczema. In other words, if they have uncontrolled, severe, moderate to severe asthma, despite being on control of therapy for like six months, they're, you know, indicated. In fact, if you follow the NH guidelines, they recommend the consideration for triple therapy, which I don't do in asthma, and, or biologic, which I do. But most people come to see me after six to eight years. And I, heard, I heard a yeah somewhere, so there's an asthmatologist lurking in this group. She knows. <laughs> and you need to you know, stand up and share your knowledge with everybody else. That's the definition of insanity. Because you've seen all the side effects that I showed you. Bone fracture, diabetes, obesity. Poor Gabriel. You know, I want to see what it would look like before he you know, got prednisone and Chick-fil-A, you know? Any other questions? Please ask questions because I gotta go catch a plane.
If you got him, ask him. And if oh, not, please give him a very warm. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. It was yeah, thank awesome. you all. Yes.